Hi everyone, this is lecture 5 for POS 201, Introduction to Political Theory. And um, today we move on to Machiavelli. And we're going to talk about Machiavelli, uh, what's called modern political theory. I'm going to talk about what that means a little bit. And um, the principles of modern statecraft, essentially the lessons that we get for um, political leadership from um, Machiavelli's The Prince. So um, what we'll cover today, first we're going to talk about the periodization of political theory, um, which I'll explain in a little bit, but essentially prior to this when we were reading The Republic and um, the uh, defense of Socrates and Crito, we were in what's called the classical era. Machiavelli, for most people, um, they define him as the beginning of the modern era, the modern conception of politics. We'll talk about what that means. We'll also discuss Machiavelli as a, a man, as a person, as a historical figure, and a political thinker. We're going to examine the prince as an understanding of political life and a practical guide for ruling. And we'll close by talking about the significance of Machiavelli and enduring debates over his work, which are pretty significant. Um, a lot of people still debate the um, different perspectives that one could take on Machiavelli and even you know what his intent was, whether the prince was meant to be um, something that we would actually follow and what Machiavelli truly believed with regard to politics or whether this was um, a more opportunistic work <clears throat> that doesn't reflect what Machiavelli really believes and it was more uh, an attempt to kind of gain the good graces of those who were in charge of his society uh, at the time. Um, so we'll, we'll run through that today, uh, cover a significant amount, and, um, and hopefully pick up this, this discussion of what we take away from Machiavelli in the discussion board. I think it's um, an interesting topic to consider whether we would actually want to follow Machiavelli's suggestions that he lays out in the prints. So um, before we do that, we have to talk a little bit about how we um, break up political theory and political thought into different periods. Um, when we started the course, um, we had the piece by Berlin, which is obviously a very contemporary piece. That was written in the 1960s. And, and then we jump back into uh, what we call the classical period, and we were reading things from from ancient Athens by, by Plato to get a sense of how this entire tradition began and what value those initial works of political theory can have for us today. And that's the period in political theory known as the classical period or antiquity. And today we take this huge, huge leap forward by about 1800 years and we start talking about Machiavelli. And um, it's, it's important to kind of talk about what we're skipping over and, and why we make that transition and you know um, why why we break up uh, political theory in the way that we do into these different periods so that classical period that I mentioned the period of um, Socrates Plato uh, Aristotle who we read in in some incarnations of this class but but not in this version um, this was a really significant uh, period. Uh, this was a period of relative political freedom. We did talk about how these were uh, democratic societies, and you know, relative to some other eras, uh, eras in human history, it's a, a period of, of relative freedom um, and, and intellectual awakening. Uh, this this period, in terms of a historical time frame. You know, basically, we're talking about um, the fifth to fourth century BC, and this uh, time period in history people generally refer to as the golden age of ancient Athens. Um, if we look at what's occurring within Athenian societies in ancient Greece at this time. It's a really remarkable period. Uh, there's new developments in science. There's new developments in technology. Uh, philosophy is beginning to become kind of a systematic uh, field of inquiry. 
mathematics, art, architecture um, are flourishing in, in ancient Greece. And um, if you've ever been to Greece or you've seen pictures of, of Greece, you know, you know that there are some really remarkable accomplishments there. Um, we see them today as, as ruins, but to have a sense that thousands of years ago, the Greek society was capable of building these incredible um, buildings and amphitheaters and, and uh, architectural achievements, you get a sense that this was a, a society that was really in a, a remarkable period of intellectual expansion and explosion. And that's the period in which um, Socrates is philosophizing and, and Plato is, is documenting that. Um, we see similar developments uh, really from the 6th century BC onward in Rome. Um, we have the development of a republican form of government in Rome, which was remarkable for its time. It was an attempt to balance power between um, the wealthy nobility, what we call the, the patricians, and the poor, uh, the plebs. Right? Um, they had this innovative constitution, they had a system of law which ultimately had a, an enormous impact on our modern institutions and, and the modern legal systems that, that we've developed today. And so really, in Western Europe, we look at this period as um, a, a, a remarkable period of, of political freedom and intellectual awakening. But um, the important thing to note is that these, these civilizations eventually fell for a number of reasons. Um, some of it was it was simply you know, disease and, and outbreaks of um, you know, various kind of health-related issues that, that impacted society. But there was corruption within society as well. There was the constant uh, threat of war and foreign invasion. These societies did not have um, the, the norms with regard to sovereignty and, and non-invasion that we have now. And so... Um, really, the, these societies were constantly threatened by the um, possibility of foreign invasion, the possibility of being <clears throat> subjected to the imperial control of other powers. Uh, borders and boundaries between different societies were constantly shifting, um, and it was security was really an ever-present concern in these societies. And so there were periodic invasions from um, the North. A the what is North Africa, right, kind of expanding upward into Europe, um, Eastern Europe expanding westward into Western Europe. There were the um, boundary lines between societies and, and civilizations were constantly shifting um, through force, through you know conquest, and also um, these societies were racked by internal factions, right. So even those societies that managed to fend off foreign invasion oftentimes fell to internal conflict, civil war. Um, civil strife. And so um, the, the period that we look at, that classical period uh, in which these great works of the classical era were written, uh, has a lifespan and eventually um, falls. The, uh, both the, the Greek and the Roman civilizations fell. And so by the 5th century AD, um, we had entered into what is called the Middle Ages, um, or the medieval era, or um, sometimes, you know, this isn't so common anymore, but some people will refer to it as the Dark Ages, which um, isn't exactly historically accurate, but, um, but, but this is, it's a different historical period. And it extends really from the end of that classical period up until really the, the 15th or 16th century in Europe, when we begin to undergo um, the Renaissance, which is the period in which Machiavelli was writing. He was writing as a product of the Italian Renaissance, um, which means rebirth. It's kind of the idea that we had these Middle Ages and now we're coming out of them and societies are um, being reborn. Right. Um, so... During that period, during the Middle Ages, uh, I don't want to imply by the fact that we skip from the classical era to the Renaissance that political theory 
wasn't occurring. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. People were still writing about justice, writing about um, political questions, normative questions. Um, we simply don't study it in here um, for reasons of brevity. You know, um, we can only cover so much, and I choose to kind of skip over that period. But I feel it's important to note um, what's what's occurring during that period, and I certainly don't want to give anyone the um, the impression that we had this intellectual explosion during the classical period, and then entered the Middle Ages or the medieval period, and political theory uh, simply went dormant. It didn't. There's lots of writings from that period of time. Um, so while we don't read any political theory in this class, uh, there are plenty of themes that are addressed during that period, and they're picked up in, in later um, contexts and different contexts, and I try and get at them in that way. Um, but I just want to lay out what was happening here and the sorts of questions that they were asking during this time period. The Middle Ages lasted about a thousand years years or so um, in, in Europe, and there are two very important developments that have a tremendous impact upon how we think about politics at this time. First being feudalism, which uh, if you've taken a Western Civ class, if you've been exposed to that in high school or earlier in college, you know a little bit about what feudalism was, but uh, basically in the face of this constant conquest that's occurring, you know, this constant threat of foreign invasion, uh, people's property being taken by foreign invaders, um, they set up this kind of social and political system, which, uh, which we know as feudalism. Feudalism basically involved a centralized government, oftentimes a, a monarchy, which would grant control over land to powerful individuals who were called lords, right? And they would grant possession of a much, much smaller plot of land to uh, less powerful individuals who were known as vassals. And it was kind of a contractual relationship. Uh, the vassal, in exchange for having this plot of land, which they would largely use for agriculture, uh, we're still talking about largely agricultural societies, uh, in exchange for that, they would pay some sort of... Um, duty or tax to the Lord, right? So this was a money-making endeavor. It was an economic arrangement. But they would also agree to provide the Lord with military service. And um, the, that was the expectation. <clears throat> you, notice, you notice I also say grant possession, but not ownership. The vassals did not own this land. They possessed it. They could work it, right? But the ownership still ultimately, you know, the ownership of the land was um, in the hands of the lords and ultimately in the hands of the centralized government that controlled the land, right? So it was a kind of a rigid hierarchy. Um, and <clears throat> feudalism created certain expectations with regard to what the individual's responsibility uh, to, to the lord was, right? You had to repay those obligations, uh, otherwise you would lose your livelihood, you would lose your land, it could be taken away from you. Um, the second major development during this period is the rise of Christianity. So remember, when we were talking about the Greeks, they did make reference to religion, and they made reference to um, divine guidance, divine wisdom, but it was not Christianity, it was a polytheistic religion. Um, it, it had existed, but, but Christianity was, was different, and it was going to uh, spread throughout Western Europe in this period. So um, this religion was monotheistic. It believed in a, a, a single god, whereas the, the Greek religions often they had multiple gods, right? um, gods for different realms of human affairs, but this was a single monotheistic religion. And um, it emphasized, at least at the time, the this notion of uh, obedience and submission before God. Um, it emphasized God's ever-present role in human affairs. And 
it articulated the need for obedience and duty to God in this earthly life to receive the rewards of the afterlife. Um, afterlife in in uh, the Greek tradition, at least, there wasn't a clear notion of rewards in the afterlife. The notion of heaven didn't really exist in its modern form. Um, so you'll remember Socrates in the defense saying that uh, we can't, you know, I can't fear death because I don't know what happens after I die. Um, in this medieval period, that would have been an incredibly subversive and um, heretical uh, statement to, to suggest that there is some sort of uncertainty about what happens after we die and to suggest uncertainty with regard to the afterlife. But in Greek society, no, it, it wasn't uh, because this modern notion of heaven and hell hadn't yet emerged. They, they didn't have that in the same way that uh, Christianity did. Um, so that's a, a really important development as well, the rise of Christianity. And um, to the extent that political theory was occurring during this time, it was largely occurring uh, within the church, at least in Western Europe. Um, so a lot of the political thought and political writing that emerges out of this period it is undertaken by theologians. It's undertaken by um, you know, uh, priests and seminarians who are dealing with the challenges that arise from this dual system of feudalism and obedience to a lord, right, and um, trying to kind of uh, avoid all of the negative things associated with foreign invasion and uh, eke out a living and an existence, um, but also with these competing commands of um, Christianity, the notion that you also have uh, obedience and a sense of obedience and a certain duty to the Christian God. And that potentially raises the question of competing loyalties. And so a lot of uh, theologians at this time, they're trying to figure out how to balance the relationship between one's uh, earthly responsibilities and your, your earthly obedience and submission with um, the power of God and what your responsibilities are there. Um, there's also just kind of really deep existential questions that emerge out of the notion of a monotheistic religion and a single God. Um, the first we could call the problem of evil, right? If, um, if there's now this all-knowing, all-powerful all God, how does he allow terrible things to happen? This is a question that we still struggle with. You know, if, if I've um, done everything that the Christian religion says I'm supposed to do, and I've been obedient, and I've been God-fearing, and I've been a good Christian, why then do terrible things happen to people like me, right? Why do I lose my loved ones? Why do I uh, undergo tragedies in my own life? And that's a question that people had to begin to grapple with uh, in a different way than if you believe in a polytheistic religion and you don't have this sense of a, a single all-powerful all God. Um, there's also this, the, the new Christian religion raises the question of free will, right? So if God is now this all-powerful being and God knows what's going to happen in the future, where is the space for human agency? What can we actually control and what should we attempt to control? That's a new question. That's a, a new development. So that's one of the other key themes that we're going to see in medieval political theory. Um, the medieval era lasts for nearly a millennium. And so many people are, for the first time, grappling with how to balance that, that spiritual duty with their obligations to those in political power, um, the element of faith, the role of God in our lives, is ever-present in this work. If you read works of medieval political theory, you, you get this sense of the centrality of God in our life. Um, but then, gradually, we start to see the emergence of kind of a different period in political theory and political thought. And we call this the modern, um, we call this modern political theory, 
the modern era, uh, modern political thought. But we, we use modern in kind of a strange way in uh, political theory. So modern and modernity, uh, when we talk about political theory, it really ironically uh, refers to political thought that begins around the 15th century. So it begins in you know, the 1400s. And modernity actually ends. Um, we generally talk about the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche who was writing in the late 19th century, uh, we talk about him as kind of the bookend to the end of modern political theory. And so political theory that's going on now in the contemporary period, we will oftentimes call contemporary political theory, or sometimes we call it postmodern political theory, implying that this, this era of modernity has, has ended. Um, so... If you ever take a course in modern political theory and you don't read anything uh, after the late 19th century, that doesn't mean that the, the professor ran out of time. That it literally means that modern political theory, the way that we use that term in political theory, that, that period's over. So what characterizes modern political theory? Um, well, it is in a lot of senses a reawakening, right? Uh, the Renaissance period, which is kind of the beginning of modern political theory, it means rebirth. And modern political theory, we see this. There's a newfound space for human agency within modern political theory. And so a lot of the works that we're going to read within modern political theory don't make much mention of God and kind of forces over and above human beings. They focus on human agency. They focus on individual will, individual autonomy. And that's that's new, right? Um, a lot of the works in the medieval era did not. They focused on God and God's will. <clears throat> and the individual is kind of more, a more passive political being. Also, this work is going to be much more concerned about the practical implications of life on earth rather than the spiritual implications of the afterlife. So much of the work that was occurring within medieval, medieval political theory was focused on what one had to do in this life to uh, gain entry into heaven and to gain access to that afterlife. But the work in the modern era focuses much more on day-to-day -day human existence and what one can do within this life um, as an individual to improve your position in this life, which with less focus on the afterlife. And then lastly, um, there's a much greater focus on observation, on perception, on human experience. Um, it's modern political theory is going to be less, uh, less focused on, one, the role of God, right, and the role of God in kind of directing us as human beings, but also it's going to move away from some of the ideal... Uh, idealistic uh, inquiry that you might have encountered in the Republic, right? The construction of a city in speech, that is an idealistic endeavor. You're creating a set of ideals and they openly say within the Republic, well, you know, we, we probably could never construct this in, in actual practice, but it's a worthwhile endeavor to think about, um, the construction of the ideal and what its perfect form would be. And that's going to begin to subside in modern political theory. And there's much more of a focus on um, using observation, perception, kind of the reality of human experience to guide uh, what we ought to be doing politically. Okay, So it is, there is a significant break. We usually identify the key figure in that break as Machiavelli. And um, I think there's, I think that's a good kind of intellectual shortcut. <laughs> I think Machiavelli does really embody most of those trends that we associate with modern political theory. The one note of caution that I would interject is that it kind of implies that this is a radical break that Machiavelli is a radical departure from this early period, earlier period 
of uh, political theory. But it just it's important to note that this is a gradual transition, that um, it, it doesn't happen overnight. And for several centuries leading up to the Renaissance, there are people um, articulating similar ideals, and it's a gradual transition away from the religious overtones of medieval political thought towards the more secular overtones of modern political theory. And Machiavelli, he's a good example of that, but he's not this kind of exceptional figure. Uh, he just happens to embody some of these qualities very well. Okay. So, um, a little bit about Machiavelli the man. Um, leads a fascinating life. He was born in 1469 in Florence. Uh, at this point, the, um, the, the city-state of Florence, modern Italy didn't exist at this point. Um, it was broken up into to various city-states, and Florence was one of these city-states. So there wasn't a unifying whole uh, that was Italy yet. Um, but he was born into Florence, and he was born to a middle-class family. And at the time, Florence was ruled by a very rich, very powerful family named the Medicis. Um, it was not a political system in which there was a great deal of popular participation in government. It was a dictatorship, essentially. I mean, the Medicis ruled with an iron hand. And they did a lot of great things for, um, for Florence. I mean, they were extremely wealthy, and they invested that wealth into society. And so if you go to um, Florence today, you see these beautiful cathedrals and buildings that were constructed by the Medicis. But even though those things have lasted, their legacy has lasted, it was not a, you know, they were not a, a kind of benevolent, democratic family. Um, they ruled over Florence with an iron hand. Um, the Medici family would be elected pope. Um, the head of the Catholic Church, uh, who was tremendous, had tremendous power, political power in Italy at this time. So the papacy, the, to, to be a pope, it wasn't yet the non-political institution that it is um, today. There, there wasn't that separation between the power of the church and the power of the state that we now see. Um, but their ability to control Florence eventually fades. And this was largely due to miscalculation in the uses of um, family finances. And so the Medicis are ousted from power in 1494. And Machiavelli, at that point, with the, in the post-Medici government, he took a post in what's called the, the chancery. And um, a chancery is essentially like an embassy. It's the um, part of the government that deals with war, defense, foreign affairs, keeping the domestic peace. And, um, and Machiavelli you know, had a position of political power uh, for that, that, that period in which the Medicis had been ousted from power. So he was um, doing lots of interesting things at that time. I mean, he was, if you want to think of what his day-to-day -day life and his day-to-day -day responsibilities were, he was in charge of um, war, defense, foreign affairs. Uh, he was actually in charge of the militia in Florence, so the army from 1503 to 1506. He made trips all over Europe in the course of his duties. He went to France numerous times. He would meet quite regularly with um, some of the most powerful individuals in all of Europe. He was a diplomat. He was a relatively powerful diplomat. And um, essentially, you know, if you want a modern day analog, he was kind of like the, the Secretary of State for the city-state of Florence. Um, but there was one problem. Florence wasn't stable at this point. Um, the Medicis had been ousted from power in 1494, but they weren't going to give up their their city. I mean, they viewed Florence as their possession, and they weren't going to give it up easily. So um, they thought they should rule, and they were doing everything they could to get back into a position of power. And by 1512, they, they did that. They regained control over Florence. So there was only this, um, you know, about a 20-year period or so in which they were out of power, um, 18, 20 years. And worse yet, the Medicis got word um, 
they, they had reason to believe that Machiavelli was one of the individuals who had conspired to throw them out of power. Um, and so they arrested, once they regained power, they arrested him on a charge of conspiracy. And as far as we know, there is no historical truth to that charge. He participated in the post-Medici government, certainly, but there was no evidence that he actually orchestrated their overthrow or was involved in the overthrow of the Medicis. But nevertheless, um, Machiavelli <laughs> is thrown into jail and he's actually tortured um, by the Medici government. It's something called torture by ropes. Um, essentially, he um, he's hung from his arms and his arms are put behind his back and the full weight of his body is uh, pressing down on his arms and it's, it's an incredibly, incredibly painful and excruciating form of torture. I mean, what happens is it it immediately dislocates your shoulders. It's um, just a really barbaric practice. And Machiavelli's tortured for an extended period of time. They're trying to get him to reveal his role in this conspiracy. And he never does. Um, he would not admit his role in a conspiracy. And as far as we know, he wasn't involved in any conspiracy. Um, so eventually he's released and he's released without charge, but they put him into exile. And so he's exiled out into the countryside, uh, kind of just in case. They, they don't trust Machiavelli because he was involved in the post-Medici government. But obviously it goes, back, it goes without saying that he's not going to go back into any position of political power at the Chancery anytime soon. Um, and ultimately he would never again return to a position of political power. He... Um, would never again be a statesman. And eventually, about 14 years after that, he was murdered um, by a Spaniard named David Gonzalez on the outskirts of Florence. Um, we're not 100% uh, sure why Machiavelli was murdered. But, um, but 16th century Italy was, was kind of a nasty place. And um, so, you know, he's probably robbed or there was probably some sort of dispute and you know fights would break out and, and people would die uh, and so Machiavelli you know never regained that position of political power he essentially died in exile and um, in a lot of ways he was a very broken and unhappy man during that period of exile um, so that is a little bit about his life and a little bit about that period of exile and the short letter that I had you read from Machiavelli to Vittori um, gives you a sense of what his life was like during this period. He's, this is actually written while he's in exile to a friend of his. And, um, and so we get kind of a snapshot of what Machiavelli's life is like. Um, hopefully from that letter, you get the sense that Machiavelli's condition is not a happy one. Uh, he's shut out of political power he um, would never again be in a position of political power. And he's trying at this point to win over the Medici family. And he's trying to regain some sort of post of political power. He has, he's essentially a merchant. I think he sells lumber or wood at this point. And he doesn't find that very fulfilling. And um, he, he really wants to regain some sort of position of political power. And he thinks he has lots to contribute to Florence. He thinks he, he really has some, some good ideas and some good experience. And so this is the period in which he's trying to devise a way to win back his position uh, as some sort of you know, ambassador or some sort of position within the chancery once again. Um, and so this period, he begins to think about what he's learned during his roughly 20 years as a statesman. He also go, begins to go back and investigate previous political thinkers and see if he can add to their insights based on uh, his own experience. So he was reading the Greeks, he was reading the Romans, he was reading medieval political theory. And he's on the outskirts of Florence, he's living among the common people, and never really loses that aspiration to get back into a position of political power. It's, this is not the life that he wants.
Um, so um, the two essential aspects of this period are Machiavelli persistently trying to win over the Medici family and return to Florence and political power. And this is ultimately one of his reasons for writing The Prince. And um, even if that doesn't happen, and he's a, enough of a realist to recognize that that might not happen, he's going to take solace in examining the political theory of those who have preceded him. And there's just a brief passage in the letter to Francesco Vittori that I'll read to you because I think it's an important one. And Machiavelli, he's basically describing his day, and he's describing this awful existence he has where he's surrounded by common, ignorant slobs. And then he comes to the section in which he talks about coming home and how he's able to cope with the fact that he's in exile, the fact that he's been kicked out of his society. And he says, um, on the coming of evening, I return to my house and I enter my study. And at the door, I take off my day's clothing covered with mud and dust, and I put on garments regal and courtly. And reclothed appropriately, I enter the ancient courts of ancient men, where, received by them with affection, I feed on that food which only is mine and which I was born for, where I am not ashamed to talk with them and ask them the reason for their actions, and they in their kindness answer me. And for four hours of time I do not feel boredom, I forget every trouble, I do not dread poverty, I am not frightened by death, entirely I give myself over to them. Um, what he is talking about there is political theory. What, is he, what he is talking about is the fact that when he comes home from his day, he doesn't actually enter uh, any sort of um, court and, and, you know, he doesn't enter any ancient courts of ancient men. <coughs> He's talking about the intellectual um, experience that he gains when he uh, reads ancient works of political theory and he um, begins to kind of deal with those fundamental questions, those normative questions that recur throughout political history. And so there's this sense that even if Machiavelli doesn't make it back into political life, he can engage in this great conversation with the political thinkers who have preceded him. And even if he's cast out, he's alone, he's uh, atomized within his own society, that earlier political thought is there waiting for him. It's waiting to receive him. And it's a really poetic kind of moving passage. And you start to empathize with Machiavelli as a person. Um, some people, when they read The Prince, they characterize Machiavelli as a teacher of evil. But that's, you know, when you read this, you get the sense that, no, this guy, he's a, he's a human being. Um, and and he, he's a human being who's suffering. And so it becomes harder to, to um, really characterize him in such a monochromatic way as just this force of evil, right? Um, so that's a little bit about Machiavelli as a, as a person in his life. And it's a really, it's a fascinating life. Um, so how to think about the prince, how to approach the prince, how to conceptualize the prince. Um, like I said, the prince is an attempt by Machiavelli to regain the favor of this powerful Medici family. In essence, um, it's an attempt to woo the ruling family and to win their favor. And some people have said that this is essentially like Machiavelli presenting his resume to the Medicis. Um, he's saying, look, I have this experience, I have this historical knowledge, I have a well-grounded sense of how the prince ought to behave, and the Medicis are trying to regain control of Florence, they're trying to consolidate their, their political power in the city-state, and perhaps you know, I can be of some use here. And so this is written for them. The dedication of the prince is to um, the Medicis. And it's, it's really, it's his attempt to kind of regain their favor, which is striking given the fact that they had tortured him um, you know, just a few years previously. So why was this work um, controversial in Machiavelli's time? Well, Obviously, you know, if you've read it, you find there's less of an emphasis on justice like we saw in the ancient Greeks, like we saw in the Republic, for example. 
And there's also less of an emphasis on obedience and duty to God, which I said was typical of medieval political theory. Um, it's also controversial in that Machiavelli doesn't act attribute outcomes or events in our lives to an all-knowing God, he attributes them to something called fortuna uh, or fortune, um, which is essentially like chance, luck, circumstances that are at least partly beyond our control. And there's also much more emphasis on human agency. There's a significant emphasis on our ability to um, shape or control our own destiny, which translates as virtue in the, the Italian, it was vertu, right? Um, so there's this notion that our ability to control events is um, something that's our own. It's moving away from the notion that God controls our lives. And that's a controversial idea. Why is the prince still controversial? Well, you might have some sense of this. I mean, when you think about this text, what shocked you about this text? Um, Machiavelli is much more accepting of utilizing extreme measures to retain control and order than other political thinkers you might have encountered, or even our own views on um, how one ought to behave politically. So he talks about murder, deception, the importance of instilling fear in one's subjects. He talks about foreign conquest and how to do it and how to do it well. And those are topics which, um, especially today, we really shy away from. We have this notion that the proper mode of um, political rule is one in which you gain the support and, and of your people and, and through that you gain a certain sense of legitimacy. Um, not necessarily murder, deception, fear, and conquest. And that's why Machiavellian, when you say that someone is behaving in a Machiavellian fashion, that's why it's a kind of a pejorative term. If somebody describes you as being Machiavellian, it's usually not a compliment. It refers to the fact that you'll resort to any measures to pursue your own ends and to pursue... Um, outcomes that are ultimately in your interest. <clears throat> um, it's important to note that that's not entirely accurate. I mean, many people have viewed Machiavelli as... Um, uh, that term, Machiavellian, is essentially being synonymous with a power-hungry leader who is resorting to any means necessary in order to retain control. And um, that's not entirely true. I mean, I don't think anyone can read The Prince and uh, come away with uh, Machiavelli, Machiavelli saying that you do whatever you have to do uh, without any restrictions. He is really, um, he really emphasizes the importance of knowing what the popular reaction is going to be to certain actions and not doing things that will result in you being hated. But he does think that fear is an important political tool, and if you can use it effectively, it can really, really um, help you out. Uh, and that kind of makes us a little bit queasy. But Machiavelli is really clever, and so he needs to be read carefully. And it's important that, you know, as you read The Prince, not to be, um, not to fall into that trap of thinking that uh, essentially anything that's bad and power hungry and evil is something that Machiavelli would support, because he wouldn't, okay? Um, so, the context of the prince. Um, I mentioned this a little bit at the outset of the lecture, but the context of the prince is a period of tremendous instability within Europe as a whole, but especially within it Italy. As I said, modern Italy does not exist um, in, in the form it does today, what you have in Italy is a bunch of different city-states. So you have uh, Florence and Naples and Rome and Sardinia and, and uh, or Sicily. Uh, you have all of these different city-states who are um, vying for power and vying for um, land and territory and resources. Right? And um, 
Machiavelli, in a lot of senses, he's he's an Italian patriot. He is really longing for the power and prestige that the region held during the Roman Empire. That was a period in which um, much of that land was controlled by an Italian empire with a seat in Rome. And so there weren't these disputes between different city-states because all of those territories were consolidated under the Roman Empire. And he really wants to see a, a powerful leader um, reunify the region again and bring back that stability and that, that power and prestige that they had during that period. Um, there's a certain amount of resentment at the Catholic Church um, within Italy at this point. Um, the, you know, if there is a, an institution that has the ability to bring forth that, that unification, it's probably the Catholic Church but it hasn't been able to do so. So there's this element of resentment there. And um, there's all over Italy and all throughout these city-states, there's corruption, there's violence, there's the constant threat of foreign invasion. Um, oftentimes these societies are somewhat chaotic and lawless, and there's a lack of political stability. And really the clearest evidence of that is if you look at uh, Florence during... Machiavelli's own lifetime, right? There was the rule by the Medici's, the Medici's were overthrown. There's a very short period of Republican rule that Machiavelli takes part in, but it's no longer than, you know, 17 or 18 years. And then the Medici's are back in power, but things are still unstable. So Florence is a good example of the type of political instability that existed at the time. And Machiavelli really wants to free Florence from that existence, from this kind of sad, chaotic existence. But not only Florence, um, really all of Italy. The final chapter of, of The Prince is this appeal for some great figure that can come along and really reunite Italy and um, bring stability and prosperity to that territory once again. Um, he says at the end of the, the Prince, this excerpt I actually don't think is included in your book, but he says, Italy's present condition is that she be more enslaved than the Hebrews, more servile than the Persians, more scattered than the Athenians, without a leader, without organization, beaten, despoiled, ripped apart, overrun, and prey to every sort of catastrophe. So Machiavelli really sees this uh, period as calling for leadership. This, the, the prince is really, it's just a desperate plea for someone to take control and someone to free Italy from this chaotic and sad existence. And that, one would argue, is why he writes The Prince. This is ultimately a book about having and holding on to power and doing whatever one can to stay in control and to stay in a position where um, you know, the city and the prince and the the um, society as a whole can benefit and can have some measure of stability and order. And so many have read that this book is a handbook for power crazed dictators. And there is that danger in what he lays out here that it can be used for those ends. But, um, but that is, you know, I think potentially a misreading of Machiavelli. I think it's, it's more important to focus on the the context of the prince and the context of his own time in which he was writing. Um, so some general concepts that we can talk about as kind of a lead into the actual text of the prince. Um, the first is this concept of fortune. Um, he has really important concepts that he introduces, and I, I kind of want to go through each of them and um, deal with those before we get into his practical advice for the prince. But the first is, is fortune which in Italian would be fortuna. Um, basically, fortune refers to circumstances which escape human control. Um, he says that uh, we control about half our lives, and half of our lives are subject to fortune, right? Which is this you know, kind of force that's beyond us, beyond our control as human beings. Note what Machiavelli's not saying here. Machiavelli is not saying that fortune is the will of God, 
or the acts of some, you know, all-powerful supreme being. Um, there's very little reference to the will of God here. And that marks an important break with medieval political history, as I was saying. Um, now, he uses some, some metaphors to talk about fortune. The first is that fortune is like a ruinous river, right? Um, and if we think about that idea, the idea that fortune is like a ruinous river, um, that is basically, those would be the times in which we can't control fortune. So those are the times in which there's simply nothing we can do. You just have to bear the onslaught of bad fortune if, um, if you're dealing with a ruinous river. But he also uses this other <clears throat> um, example, which is um, incredibly uh, kind of politically incorrect and, and gender biased, right? But it, it I think, speaks to... Um, how gender was viewed at the time and how women were viewed at the time. Um, but he says fortune is like a woman, right? Um, he says that we must beat her, we must struggle with her, that she favors the young, she favors the more vital. And, um, and so in this sense, right, fortune as a woman, Machiavelli is saying in really inappropriate language, it's essentially like uh, a rape metaphor, but he's saying that there are instances in which we can meet fortune head on and we can bend it to our will in the same way that, you know, a man can bend a woman to his will. Um, so not the most appropriate metaphor and one that we really shrink away from today. We view that as a misogynistic idea that... Uh, a woman is this kind of fickle force that we beat into submission. No one would defend that idea. But for the broader purpose of articulating what fortune is and what it means in our political lives, he's saying essentially that there are um, times in which we can't confront fortune and times in which we can confront fortune and times in which we can um, dominate or master fortune. All right. So... Um, Machiavelli's use of the term fortune is really important. It gives us a sense of his break with medieval theory, which is really wrapped up in, in the idea of God and how God shapes and orders our lives. Um, and that's, it's simply not a factor in his theory. Right? The will of God really doesn't enter into the prince very much. Uh, so we get a broader sense of how politics is moving in a secular direction uh, as, we, as we enter modernity. And we also um, get the sense of how Machiavelli's theory is one that calls upon us to resist fortune where possible, to seize moments where we think we can shape or direct fortune. And so in that sense, this is a theory of action. This is a theory of agency. Um, in some senses, this is a theory of manliness, right? These traditional masculine ideas that, you know, one has to be a man of action, um, there's this masculine notion of taking control, of mastery, of domination. And the fact that he's made woman, uh, uh, he's made fortune a woman, that just reinforces that idea. Okay. Um, the second general concept that we encounter in the prince is um, virtue or vertu. Right? Um, now, when we say virtue, uh, in the sense that we use it today, right? If we were to call someone virtuous, we'd be saying that um, they're a good person, they're kind, they engage in uh, generous actions. And <clears throat> although uh, virtue is the way that we, we translate it in Machiavelli, that's not exactly accurate in terms of how he, how he uses the term, what he means by it. Um, for him, virtue is just the human energy, the human action that stands in opposition to fortune. So here, Machiavelli is referring to drive, talent, ability, um, your ability to kind of direct yourself towards the achievement of, of certain goals. And he thinks this is a vital quality for a prince. You have to have virtue in order to... Um, 
both recognize the instances in which you can step in and bend fortune to your will, um, but but also um, not only recognize those instances, but but take advantage of them to actually do it. So it's one thing to recognize that someone needs to act and there's space to act. It's another thing entirely to do it. And he says virtue enables us to recognize that we should seize the moment, but it also gives us courage to act um, when the outcome is uncertain. Right? We don't know whether or not we're going to succeed. So we have to have courage in order to do it. And we have to have a certain tenacity. We have to have a certain drive to conquer fortune because it's never going to be easy. All right. um, so virtue is kind of the second general concept that we encounter quite a bit within the prince. Um, now the qualities of the prince, uh, I won't go into these in great detail. I kind of talk about them in generalities um, because basically I think there's, I think you could spend an entire semester on the prince. I, mean, I, I think you could really delve into detail with all of the things that he suggests and, and really um, there's, there's just so much richness in the prince in terms of its advice that um, I try and stick at the level of generalities and draw out a few examples, but there's far too many examples to go to go into. It's kind of a laundry list of different things that the prince should do that ultimately you have to debate on your own whether or not you think they're good ideas or whether or not you think um, they should be done. But uh, in terms of general qualities of the prince, um, Machiavelli's um, theory is really rooted in the idea of a prince that can seize control, that can maintain control, and um, have the courage to face uncertainty. It's rooted in this opposition between fortune and virtue. And when he looks at his own society, what he sees is a lack of virtue, right? When he looks at Florence or he looks at the Italian city-states as a whole, or really much of Europe at this time, he's looking at societies where fortune has run amok, societies where you don't have somebody to step up and um, try and seize and control fortune. <clears throat> and so on that basis, um, the prince really needs to be somebody who can seize control and who can maintain control and who has the courage to, to face uncertainty. And what's really important is that that may involve emphasis on the may um, that may involve being vicious but it's done not simply because you enjoy watching people suffer right not simply because you enjoy hurting people but it's done with that larger end of maintaining power and hopefully uh, beyond maintaining power introducing unity and control over society which he thinks at the present time is currently lacking right um, so when I teach the prince in the classroom, normally this is the point at which um, I ask students for uh, just different pieces, different little nuggets of advice <clears throat> that we get from Machiavelli and the prince. And there's dozens of these. You know, there's dozens of these little kind of anecdotes that we could pull out of the prince um, and discuss and ultimately discuss whether or not we think this is good advice or bad advice. Um, teaching an online course, we don't really have that, that luxury. Um, so I've just kind of reproduced here some of the uh, most common um, examples that people cite from the prints, and I'll just briefly talk about them. But um, I emphasize that this is, there are lots of lessons in the prints, and this is an incomplete list. Uh, but these are the ones that I tend to hear um, when, I, when I talk about this in class. Um, the first one that most people <clears throat> most people uh, know, and most people know actually before they've even read The Prince, uh, most people, when they think of Machiavelli, this is what they think of. Um, but <clears throat> people will say, oh, well, Machiavelli says it's better to be feared than loved. Right? And Machiavelli, Machiavelli does say that. Um, I mentioned just a few minutes ago that Machiavelli thinks that fear is an important political force, thinks that any worthwhile conception of um, unity and, and uh, order probably has to involve some measure of fear and some measure of um, fear of whoever the authority figure is. Right? Um, 
<clears throat> but there's a second part to that. There's a second part to that piece of advice that um, people never, or people very rarely uh, recognize is there, but it's a really important one. He says it's better to be feared than loved, but there's a couple addendums to this. Uh, it's better to be feared than loved if one cannot be both, right? So there is this notion that ultimately you could be feared and loved, right? But if you run into a choice where you have to, if you run into a situation where you have to choose between one or the other, you should choose fear because fear is a more effective motivator than love, right? Um, so that's kind of the first addendum. And then the second addendum is never hate it, right? And this is where the notion that the prince is uh, a strategy handbook for how to be a dictator falls apart. Um, it's better to be feared and love, but feared than love, but never hated. Well, most dictators are hated, right? They rule through oppression. They rule through brutality. And Machiavelli would look at that and say, no, if, if you reach the point where you're being hated, if you're reviled, if you're despised, people may fear you, but they also hate you, right? Um, and so you have to be very judicious in your use of violence, in your use of force, and how you cultivate a sense of fear within your population. Because if, if it ends up a situation that you're hated, then yeah, you're, you won't succeed as prince, right? You won't be able to unify your population. Um, eventually, you might even be overthrown. So um, <clears throat> that's, I think, normally the insight that people take away from the prince. But it's important to point out that it's a lot more complex than it's usually stated. Uh, some other things as well. Machiavelli says the prince must both be a lion and a fox. The implication being that um, the prince has to be ferocious. They have to be vicious, if need be. But they also have to be a fox. They have to avoid traps. They have to be smart, cunning, um, <clears throat> ability. They have the ability to recognize when they're being led into a trap or they're being manipulated in some way. Um, one of the things that Machiavelli focuses on quite a bit is the importance of securing glory in the eyes of the people, the prince securing glory in the eyes of his people. Um, he has to do great things for society. Right? People must recognize that um, the prince is doing great things and they have to associate the, the prince with those great things. That's how you gain the support of the common people. So that means constructing great things, building wondrous monuments to your success. When someone does something good, you reward them, and you reward them with something tremendous. Right? And when do someone does something bad, you punish them. And people have to recognize that you, know, you are responsible for that. Uh, you have to kind of create this aura around yourself in order to be a, an effective leader. Um, and Prince also gives uh, quite a bit of suggestions with regard to statecraft and uh, war and peace. And one of his, uh, one of Machiavelli's um, key assertions is that one should never rel rely upon mercenaries. Uh, to the extent that you have to defend your society, to the extent that you decide to go out and conquer other societies, it should be your army, your people, that are doing it. That's the only way that you'll ever succeed and maintain those territories for an extended period of time. But to rely upon mercenaries who are, you know, foreign soldiers for hire, essentially, um, that's not an effective strategy because uh, you can't guarantee their loyalty. You're essentially buying their loyalty. And so it's not a long-term strategy in terms of um, either protecting your own society or holding on to new acquisitions. Um, Machiavelli also says that he makes this distinction between um, being and appearing, uh, seeming and being. Right? He says that the prince must seem to be many things. The prince must seem to be humane. They must seem to be generous. They must seem to be kind and religious and um, thoughtful and intelligent and uh, an excellent military planner and all of these different things, you know, have tremendous qualities of leadership and, um, and, and kindness and benevolence. And, um, but 
only if, right, you only um, appear to be certain things if they uh, don't interfere with your maintenance of power, right? So you have to seem to be all of the things that society values. And you have to seem to have those good and virtuous, in our sense, right, characteristics of, um, of being a leader. But you're only those things insofar as they don't interfere with you maintaining your power. So um, do your best to cultivate a reputation of generosity. But if you um, start to actually you know, try to be generous and it's drawing away resources that ultimately make you weaker, then you shouldn't be doing that. You have to um, cultivate the reputation, but do whatever works for you in terms of maintaining power. Um, same thing with religion, right? You want to seem to be faithful and devout and pious, but if adhering to the strictures of religion complicates your ability to maintain power over your society, then ultimately your ultimate responsibility right, has to be maintenance of power. And so you cultivate the image, but it's not so important whether or not you actually live up to it in practice. You just have to seem to be that, right? Um, <clears throat> and lastly, of the, the ones that I pick out here, um, Machiavelli talks a lot about violence and the use of violence. And he says, okay, yeah, if you're going to engage in violence, well, you'll probably have to engage in violence. And it, if you're going to do it, if you're going to engage in violence, you do it swiftly. Um, you do not want to draw out violent actions. Say that there's some challenge to your rule. Say that there's some group or family or faction that disagrees with you being in power. Well, <clears throat> to the extent that you can't um, change their minds or buy them off, you'll probably have to kill them. Uh, but you want to kill them swiftly. You want to have this really kind of swift act of violence. And you want it to be a spectacle. You want uh, everyone to know that you've engaged in violence, you've done it swiftly, you've done it quickly, and it's um, you know, very visible so that others won't challenge you, so that you can actually limit your use of violence if people still have the memory of that spectacle fresh in their minds. Right? Um, that's one of those things that makes us a little bit queasy. That's one of those things that makes us a little bit uneasy when we have our practical advice for the key political figure of a society being that, yeah, we recognize that you're ha gonna have to engage in violence, but you have to do it um, really kind of in a shocking fashion and very quickly. Um, that's one of those things we don't like to think about. But that is his advice for the prince. He says that, yeah, you're probably gonna have to use violence and if you do it, you know, make it a big show and do it as quickly as you can. Don't draw it out over a long period of time. And there's many more. You know, that's those are just um, <clears throat> kind of a, a smattering of different things that Machiavelli talks about in The Prince, but I think it's enough to give you a general sense of the perspective that we encounter in The Prince, and it's it's kind of a frightening one. It's kind of a frightening one for a lot of people. Um, other people look at the prince and they say, <clears throat> this is what we need. This is the prince being, you know, a realist. He, um, Machiavelli recognizes that uh, we can't have this kind of perfect uh, set of ideals that we live up to in every circumstances. Politics is a nasty game. And so sometimes we do have to do things that um, are make us uncomfortable, but it's the nature of politics. It's the nature of um, any position of power, right? Um, so uh, why is the prince so controversial? Having gone through those things, you, you might have a, a sense of why the prince is so controversial. Um, many see the prince as abandoning independent notions of good and bad uh, in, in politics, abandoning the notion that there is some universal standard of what is good and what is bad, what is just and what is unjust. Machiave Machiavelli is essentially saying that um, those ideas vary. It's going to depend on circumstances. <clears throat> it's going to depend on the consequences of one's actions. 
whether um, whether something is good or bad. But there is no universal standard. There's no universal standard of you know what is what is just or what is good or bad. It's whatever enables the person in power to maintain their control and maintain their power, and whatever um, facilitates the unity of the state, whatever enables that <clears throat> common political leader to maintain control. Um, another reason why the prince is um, so controversial is his he endorses these behaviors that uh, just make us uncomfortable in the modern era. Um, murder, conquest, lying, deceit, right? Um, he recognizes that these things are, are necessary. Uh, he thinks that these things are truly necessary. And that, um, especially in a, a modern, kind of advanced, democratic society, I think most of us um, question that. They question the extent to which those behaviors are uh, necessary and would not want to endorse those those behaviors. Um, so there's a certain, you know, people generally look at Machiavelli and they think it's a really cynical, really dark vision of what politics has to be. And they think that politics can be more than that. And politics doesn't have to be this zero sum um, kind of struggle for existence, but we can actually kind of compromise and negotiate. And we don't have to set about eliminating political enemies in the way that Machiavelli suggests we might have to do. And then lastly, um, <clears throat> Machiavelli's historical examples. Um, if you look at the people who he praises, he praises certain people uh, by name here. Um, for instance, you have the, the Borgias, Caesar, Caesar Borgia and Lucrezia Borgia. You have um, Hannibal. These are individuals who, if you know anything about their history and their historical context, they're generally individuals who are regarded as ruthless, um, willing to do anything to advance their ends. And so a lot of people find it a bit hard to swallow a theory of politics that cites those individuals as examples, as people that you know we ought to aspire to, to be. Um, the Borgias, for example, I mean, they're, they're, they were this kind of political family um, in, in Europe and were famous for killing political enemies. Lucrezia Borgia, uh, there's the story that she had this, this ring that was hollow and it would be filled with poison and they would frequently poison, you know, um, political adversaries, not even enemies, not people that were out to kill them, but people that were simply in their way. And so Lucrezia Borgia would empty out her hollow ring into this person's drink and they would die and so that person would be out of the way and um here is machiavelli holding up that person as an example someone to aspire to so um there are lots of reasons why the prince still remains kind of a controversial text in political theory and, and a really important question to focus on is whether or not this is anything we'd ever want to aspire to okay but keep in mind um as you, you contemplate that question, Machiavelli's historical context. Uh, I, I really, I don't want you to come away with the interpretation that Machiavelli is this teacher of evil, but we have to take into consideration that Machiavelli saw his own society and all European societies as lacking order and lacking unity. And that for him was ultimately something more frightening than, um, uh, society in which you had a strong unifying leader who would periodically engage in violence or sometimes had to do certain vicious things in order to maintain power. Um, there's quite a few enduring controversies and debates about Machiavelli and um, about the prince. And I'll just kind of run through these quickly. Um, the, the first controversy or debate, which I um, mentioned at the outset, is whether or not Machiavelli really believed in what he was writing. Um, so many view the prince as this opportunistic work. They say that Machiavelli wrote this 
not because he believed it necessarily, but because he wanted to regain favor with the Medicis and he wanted to work his way back <clears throat> into government. And so he doesn't necessarily believe the horrendous things that he's writing, but he knows he has to make an impression on this group and perhaps they would be um, wooed by somebody who you know appears to have this kind of um, this authoritarian streak within him, right? Um, <clears throat> there's also, some people have even argued that Machiavelli was uh, laying a trap for the Medicis. Um, some have said that Machiavelli was um, hoping that the Medicis would follow his advice and that he knew that this was really bad advice. <laughs> he knew that if the Medicis actually followed through with some of his suggestions, they would begin to be hated by Florence. And so that Republican government of which he was a part could be restored, right? Um, that's kind of a fringe interpretation. Uh, there is a political theorist named Mary Dietz who's, who's laid out that conception. And um, some people buy into that, but I think that's still kind of a, a minority interpretation of what Machiavelli was doing in The Prince. Um, but the reason why there, there are these enduring debates about the prince in particular, is that Machiavelli's second most noted work of political theory, which is actually in your book, um, and I know you guys have a ton of reading, and so I, I didn't assign it, but if you really, if you're interested in Machiavelli and the prince was really interesting to you, um, maybe go and read a bit of the discourses on Livy. But his, his second most famous work is the discourses on Livy, and um, in that work, he defends an expansive role for popular participation and um, what we call a Republican conception of government, not Republican in the sense of, um, you know, the Republican Party in the United States, but uh, a system of government, <clears throat> again, uh, kind of drawing on the Romans in which you would have popular participation, you would have an engaged citizenry, checks and balances, rule of law. Um, that's the, the government that he's arguing for. And he actually criticizes principalities. And he argues that the people ought to be participating in politics. Um, <clears throat> so much of the contemporary discussion on Machiavelli is, is how we rectify what seem to be two really different conceptions of politics. The, the conception of politics that we get in The Prince, which is um, somewhat authoritarian, very authoritarian potentially, and the Republican conception of government that we get in the discourses on Livy. And um, I'm not really going to get into that here. I don't, I don't have you read the discourses, but just recognize that there is um, this significant and rich debate about whether or not Machiavelli actually believed what he was writing in the prints. Um, so even now, roughly 500 years after Machiavelli has died, we're still trying to sort out exactly what he meant. And we're still thinking about whether um, the, the prince is really a practical vision of politics that we, we would want to support and whether the, there are um, lessons or, or uh, kind of guidelines and structures that can be taken from the prince that we would actually want to emulate. Um, so that wraps up our, our discussion of Machiavelli for today. Um, kind of an interesting video clip for today. Uh, the video clip is from the movie The Godfather. I imagine most of you have probably seen The Godfather. I mean, The Godfather is a, a classic uh, of, of American film. It's just an iconic movie of the 20th century. A lot of people, when they're asked to talk about the greatest movies of all time will cite The Godfather. The Godfather is a lot of people's favorite movie. Um, and just to set this up for you, if you're not familiar with it, there's this scene at the end of The Godfather, and it's a really kind of striking um, scene, where Michael Corleone is kind of consolidating his role as the Godfather in a mafia family. And he is... Um, He's in a church at, at a baptism, right? And um, at the same time as Michael Corleone is in the church in the bapti uh, 
watching this and participating in this baptism, he's having his uh, enemies, the people that would potentially be problematic for him in his rise to power and his consolidation of power, he's having them eliminated. They're being killed. So you're seeing <laughs> this crazy juxtap juxtaposition of him in a church, which is this um, scene of you know purity and goodness and godliness, but you're seeing it juxtaposed with really brutal murders. People are being shot, people are being killed. And um, I think it's, it's really interesting to consider that in relation to Machiavelli's advice for the prince. Um, so in that context, like, you can hop, you can watch this clip and then hop over to the discussion board. But I think an interesting thing to consider is whether Michael Corleone is adhering to the advice of Machiavelli and, um, and how, how is he doing so? And the broader question that we need to think about is whether anyone should adhere to the guidelines and suggestions that Machiavelli lays out in the prints. And as I said, some people view this as um, a very important, very uh, instructive political document, and other people view it as abomination. They view it as something which we should avoid at all costs. You do not want to follow Machiavelli's advice. Um, and it, it just depends on kind of where you stand in relation to what type of endeavor, what type of um, realm of human activity you think politics really is. So that is that is the broader question, is should anyone follow Machiavelli's advice in the prints? And um, I'll be interested to see your thoughts. Um, and even if you have seen The Godfather before and you know the scene I'm referring to, uh, maybe just watch it again. Watch it again in the context of uh, what you've just read and what I've just discussed with Machiavelli, because I think it's it's interesting to um, to think about. So um, for next time, we're discussing uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. They uh, chronologically come along a little bit later, um, kind of after Machiavelli, right at the outset of a political period we call the Enlightenment, an intellectual period we call the Enlightenment. And um, they're both... Uh, individuals, political thinkers that we associate with the liberal tradition, um, but liberal in political theory, we use it in a very specific sense. We mean liberal in terms of liberty, not liberal in terms of progressive. I'll talk about that a little bit more next time. Um, so they're really important thinkers in the history of Western political thought, and they're definitely both important thinkers in relation to the system of govern government that we have here in the United States. Um, for next time, we're going to look at Hobbes and Locke, and we're uh, ultimately focusing on their questions of how we legitimate government and um, how they both examine the origins of political obligation. Uh, they're analyzing the foundations of government. They're analyzing the need for a state, a need for a centralized political authority, and why we need to obey the state, why we would ever you know, create and decide to obey the state. Um, and so something which Machiavelli, at least in The Prince, he reduces to force and fear and a sense of awe, right? Um, so in Machiavelli, we obey the state because we're forced to, we fear the state in some sense, and uh, at least in part, we're awed by the state. Um, it's a much more complex question for Hobbes and Locke. They have a really interesting account of why we obey the state um, based on the idea of a social contract, right? The idea that essentially um, government is a contractual relation between the, govern, the governed and the governors, the citizens and the state. Um, and so that's what we'll delve into more for next time. Um, so I'll leave it there and we'll pick up with Hobbs and Locke next time. Thanks.